Mr. Bill, it is such a pleasure to meet you. You've been a longtime idol of mine. Uh, we do share a number of things in common. Uh, Yale Law School graduates who went into other things. I guess that's actually a large group, but specifically media and journalism. And I know you've been very active in efforts back at Yale to sort of beef up uh, journalism and uh, media resources. I was curious, this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, what led you to go to law school? Uh, you've had such a phenomenal career in media and journalism. What, what, why did uh, the law bug bite? Well, my stuff was in New Haven, so I mean, I, I was, <laughs> oh, yes, there for I was at Yale here, College, yes. and I had a, an old Volvo, and I had a mechanic there who was honest, and I didn't want to get out, and um, <clears throat> I think I went to law school for the reason that most, probably 60% of all people still go to law school, which is their parents didn't think they should just have a BA, <laughs> and I was lucky enough to get into the world's easiest law school, because when I applied to law school, I had a full-time job while I was an undergraduate, I was working in New York City uh, for John Lindsay, who was the mayor of yes. New York, and had started doing some writing. And by the time I started uh, law school, I was working full time for New York Magazine, writing magazine articles. So, um, you know, uh, Yale Law School, I think, is the greatest place in the world, but it's also <coughs> was then, is now, the easiest place to be a law student. <laughs> I, won't dis I won't disagree with you there. And, um, <laughs> But I, I, the, the odd thing was I actually liked it and liked the courses more than I thought I would. I mean, I found myself driving up to New Haven from New York. I was living in New York for an um, income tax class at 9 in the morning because I just <laughs> liked it. It was like this great intellectual puzzle. So I liked the courses more than I expected to and went to a fair number of them. Okay. And is that, how did you then start the American Law? Well, it's very simple. I was um, standing outside the uh, the placement office mm -hmm. where they get people interviews to yeah. work at law firms and I, I, I had office. no idea that it was the placement office because I'd never been in there. <laughs> in fact, I still have never been in there. <laughs> but it's where the soda machines were. And there was this bulletin board there and on the bulletin board were all these letters from all these law firms on the same high grade bond stationery, all offering students an unusually rewarding experience at an unusually um, you know, well-equipped uh, law firm with unusually high standards <laughs> of excellence and integrity, looking for students with unusually high intellectual <laughs> capability who wanted to practice in an unusually unique environment. <laughs> Just all said the same thing, same letterhead. And I was writing magazine articles at the time, and I remember thinking to myself, they all can't be the same. <laughs> I mean, they're all, they have different people. Some of them have to be more energetic than others, more successful than others. Uh, you know, some of them probably offer more opportunity to non-whites than others, or you know, God forbid, uh, to females than others. And I just kept thinking, Gee, I'd like to try to write about a law firm or two as an institution. And um, suggested to my editors at New York Magazine at one point that I take a crack at that, so, since after all I was going to law school, so I must know something. <laughs> and I ended up writing this article in 1976, just after I graduated, about these two guys who had not been able to get jobs at any Wall Street firms because they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And one of them had gone to a firm, he'd been I think number three or four in his class at Harvard Law School and had gone to a little firm called Skadden Arps and <laughs> something or another. Okay. And this other guy, Marty Lipton, along uh, with yes. some buddies of his from NYU, had started their own firm just down the street actually. And what was really intriguing about the two firms was that they were doing this work that nobody else wanted to do, which was corporate takeover fights. So I wrote this article in New York Magazine saying that these two unknown guys at these two small law firms, Skadden might have been 25 people at the time or 30 <laughs> and Wachtell might have been 10 people, were going to be the two most successful law firms in New York. And I did this article. And it had this incredible reaction. People just all over the place. So I kept. So I started thinking to myself, maybe there's a magazine here. Maybe there's a magazine about the business of law firms. Okay. And that's what that, that idea just sort of rattled around in my head for a while, and then um, got really serious about it. I, I wrote a book about uh, the Teamsters Union, yep. which did very well and was a bestseller. And I took some of that money and raised some money, and started this magazine called The American Lawyer, which I handed out. Um, up a few blocks at the Hilton Hotel at the 
American Bar Association convention in August of 1978, okay. handed out free copies. Ah, oh, so you were originally free. <laughs> well, it was a sample issue. It, okay. had, a, it had a subscription uh, amount on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I almost got arrested there doing <laughs> it. I mean, people th and people were taking it and reading it, but didn't want to be seen reading it. Ah. And the, the, the lead article was about a guy named Don Rubin, who had been a partner at Kirkland & Ellis, and had left Kirkland & Ellis, God forbid, to start his own firm. And no one really ever did that. And it was all about why he did it, how he did it, and who he was oh. gathering mm -hmm. as a client. And that's how the whole thing started. Interesting. Now, why, why is it that people <coughs> are sort of, quote unquote, embarrassed to be seen with this? Uh, the the well, legal. More. I mean, the, the irony well, is then, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember then when I started, and, and, and what also was happening in between was from the New York Magazine article, mm -hmm. my editor from uh, New York Magazine, Clay Felker, had left New York yes, Magazine in a good. takeover fight and uh, gotten hold of Esquire. So I convinced him that I was going to start a column in Esquire about lawyers, not about law. Okay. And I started doing this column, and I remember one of the first items I got from a buddy of mine who just graduated in my class at law school was that um, some airline, a now defunct airline called Braniff Airlines. Oh, yes, I remember Braniff. They had that had orange color scheme. Right. Brown, had yeah. dumped, I'm going to make this up, had dumped Jones Day in Washington for Wilmer Cutler or vice versa, okay. something like that. And I called Lloyd Cutler, whom I, I knew, um, because I'd written a profile of him in, in Esquire, um, and I asked him about this, and he said, well, no one would be interested in that. And I said, well, Lloyd, why don't you just make believe that <laughs> I'm the editor <laughs> and you're the guy I'm okay. calling for an interview. Humor we'll me, see sure. who's okay. interested. He said, you can't write that. That's just impermissible. It violates the, the code of professional responsibility. And I said, well, which part of the code would that be that it violates? I said, you had a customer, and you lost a customer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that violates attorney-client privilege. This doesn't violate anything. <laughs> what do you do? In fact, the airlines uh, had, uh, um, as I recall, a law firm had to file its representation with the Civil Aeronautics Board mm -hmm. or something. So actually, they were so technically officially representing ah, them anyway. Yes. So it was mm -hmm. public exactly. record, but yeah. not that that mattered really. Sure. Um, and th that's sort of the way the whole thing started. Was people kept saying, "Well, nobody's interested in this, and you shouldn't write it because it's gossip," and for. Years, I would say, well, you know, if Fortune magazine does a story about how XYZ ad agency lost, you know, General mm -hmm. Motors as a client, that's called a business story. Yeah. And if we do a story about how General Motors switches law firms, that's gossip. That doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's part of what we do, and it's, it's business news. And mm -hmm. if you're an associate or a law student and you want to know about law firms, you should want to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we applied you know, more rigorous standards than not to, to checking everything because everybody was out for us. I mean, the, you know, people wanted to sue us all the time. I remember I, I was doing, we were doing some profile of some guy in Birmingham, Alabama, and I get this letter on his letterhead, Dear Mr. Brill, one of your associates contacted me, he wants to do a story about me and my firm. I think they were involved in some labor, you know, busting issue yeah. or something. And um, please be informed that you do not have our permission to write about us, and therefore we will take all appropriate action <laughs> if you do. And I went and I found a copy of the Constitution, I photocopied <laughs> the First Amendment, and I clipped it, and, <laughs> you know, dear Mr. So-and-so, I'm attaching, you know, this is when you wrote real letters, yes. it was an mm -hmm. email, where now you could just paste yeah, it, but, exactly. you know, I, had to, yeah. I literally <laughs> had to paste it. Um, dear Mr. So-and-so, um, I know it's only an amendment, and therefore you might have missed it, since it's not part of the, the original Constitution, but it is the first of those amendments, so <laughs> you probably should have noticed it. Um, I'm attaching it for your information. Um, it's, on the, you know, it's on this basis that we're actually going to write the article. <laughs> That's excellent.